for tonight's community information meeting here at the Town of Paradise. Just a quick housekeeping. So tonight you will hear a series of presentations back to back. Um, you may leave your questions in the social media feed. We will do our best to answer as many as possible tonight. There will be a Q&A with time allowed at the end of the event. So at this point, I would like to introduce our mayor, Steve Potter. So good evening and welcome to our March virtual town hall meeting. I'm Steve Prater, mayor for the town. I'm hoping soon that these meetings will be in person. I would like to acknowledge two of my fellow council members at the meeting tonight, Vice Mayor Jody Jones and Council Member Woody Culleton. We all have had a lot going on over the last two and a third years. We've all had tremendous challenges to overcome as well as successes. Tonight you will hear updates on the town's challenges and many successes. Although you may not see everything the town is doing, rest assured that each and every staff member and council person is working hard for you. You are the now, you are the new Paradise Pioneers and on behalf of the entire town, I wanna thank you for standing with this town as we rebuild sharing our challenges and successes together. Our community is who is moving us forward and why we are Paradise Strong. So please let us share with you all the great things we have going on. We have made tremendous progress over the last two years and we're not nearly done. So with that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to our town manager, Kevin Phillips. Thank you, Mayor Crowder. Thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and being here with us. Uh, I wanna reiterate kind of what uh, Mayor Crowder said is that we have had our challenges, but our challenges are temporary, our successes are permanent. And you're gonna hear a lot uh, about tonight about the successes that we are moving forward with. And like ma the mayor said, sometimes you don't see it, but there's a lot of things that are happening on a daily basis that are moving us forward to those successes so that our rebuild is going to be great. So I just wanna kinda of share a few numbers here. Um, building permit data to date, currently uh, 1,520 building permit applications have been received. Uh, 1,367 building permit is, uh, permits have been issued and 658 CFO certificates of occupancy for brand new homes have been issued in the town of Paradise. 301 multifamily units applied, 283 of those have been issued, and 92 multifamily units have been rebuilt. Quite a success for a really short period of time. We're still seeing a lot of applications and permits coming in, and so we hope that this will continue to move forward and these numbers will continue to increase. So with that, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to our Disaster Recovery Director, Katie Simmons, to start the meeting off with a update on our long-term recovery plan. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Katie Simmons, Disaster Recovery Director for the Town of Paradise. As Kevin was mentioning, our building permit application um, activity, it's really exciting to see that all of those numbers are outpacing even our most um, I would say enthusiastic predictions early on after the fire. So looking at the long-term community recovery plan, just wanna remind everybody, this was a plan developed uh, by the community with Urban Design Associates in 2019. The plan was um, funded by Butte Strong Fund and Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. So we continue to be very grateful for their support. And the long-term community recovery plan essentially set a vision for the town's recovery, helping us understand what projects, even conceptually, will really help us design the paradise of the future. So the series of tier one, tier two, and tier three town-led and partner-led um, priority projects are really coming to fruition in 2021. So we're really excited that in 2019 and 2020, we had the opportunity to do a lot of planning and as Kevin said, a lot of behind the scenes work. And in 2021, we're gonna see a lot of these projects really come to fruition. 
So uh, here's a, real, a quick snapshot of what I'm going to be covering today. You can see we have two tier one uh, priority projects, a tier two priority project, the broadband services, and reseeding is really um, coming up behind our hazardous tree removal programs. So on the receding plan, um, as I said, this is going to follow the hazard tree removal in the town. So we have the private program ongoing and the state uh, government program ongoing that we're going to hear a little bit more about later. Um, and reseeding will really help us understand how to um, utilize the opportunity to um, replant and reseed in a safe and sustainable way here in Paradise. Um, you know, we know the trees coming down is obviously a critical phase of our recovery. It, as I mentioned, it's still ongoing and will be for some time. But in the private program, I'm really happy to announce that we have 97% of those properties complete. So these are properties that have been uh, certified clear of hazardous trees, and we're so grateful for those property owners for taking that action. As I said, the next phase is reseeding, and this is really for erosion control in the town. We know the ecology is changing with that tree canopy coming down. We know this means a lot of weed growth in town, um, but also for beautification. So we're currently in the planning processes. We've, the town has issued an RFP looking for a consultant to work with us on the reseeding design and scoping process. Community input will be part of this process, and we'll be able to send out an announcement regarding that here shortly. What we're going to be developing is an educational campaign so that the, the residents really understand how to replant and reseed safely, as I mentioned. And then once we have a plan in place, the town is going to be seeking funding for reseeding the public rights of way, the public spaces in town um, that will allow us to see some beautification projects really occur. So we're, we're super excited about that. The early warning system is a tier one town-led priority project in the long-term community recovery plan. And I have to say we had a lot of community input in the design and scoping process, which we completed in 2020. Really a record-breaking number of comments coming through on our survey. And that community input was really used to design the best possible project for the town. So an early warning system is essentially a series of siren towers that will be spaced very strategically throughout town, um, most likely on public property. These siren towers, according to community input, according to requests of the community, will have an audible siren sound, but also verbal instruction. And that will help in the case of an emergency, you know, folks really understand what to do in town. So we have applied in 2021 for construction funding from hazard mitigation for this project and we're hoping to be awarded those funds so that we can go ahead and install those siren towers in, in town. Um, and if awarded, we will go ahead and work with those public agencies on the locations for these siren towers. As I mentioned, we had record-breaking feedback from the community on really designing this project and I want to share a few of those highlights. 96% um, of the community who responded to the survey said that they would sincerely appreciate the early warning system and to receive those similar notifications on their phones. 92% um, said that they were concerned about power outages or PSPS events during red flag days, which may interfere with community warnings, so those siren towers would help us overcome some of those concerns. 89% um, said an early warning system would make them feel safer living in town, so obviously we take that very seriously when we think about the rebuild process. 82% um, would support a siren near their home or business, and the majority of people would like to see the early warning system be tested monthly, and I just, just want to assure you that those tests can be done silently. So as we move forward on the early warning system, you know, hoping for those construction funds to come in, um, the town will be keeping the community updated on all of our channels. Now moving to broadband, um, we're excited to announce that next Tuesday, uh, March 9th, the GIC, uh, Ge Geographic Information Center at Chico State Enterprises is going to be delivering the broadband feasibility study to our town council. The broadband feasibility study will help us understand possible deployment of townwide broadband capabilities. We know that a high-speed data network is a critical service for quality of life, life and economic development during the town's recovery, and certainly this was listed as a Tier 2 partner-led priority in the long-term community recovery plan. 
And I have to say for all of those out there who are like me dealing with COVID, we know that we rely on the internet for working, for schooling, for healthcare, for paying our bills, for um, all sorts of daily life activities like shopping and ordering food. So we know that um, our need for and our demand on internet services is not going to go away and we want to make sure that we're providing this critical utility to our residents now and in the future. I want to mention that the broadband feasibility study that we're going to be releasing next Tuesday was funded in part by the Butte Strong Fund. And our next step really um, at the direction of council will be to engage the private sector in really understanding the town's options for um, really installing this, this uh, critical infrastructure in our town. So lastly, I want to talk about roads. And you know, if you've driven around Paradise, uh, it's probably crossed your mind that re rehabilitating and reconstructing our roads is going to be a priority of the future. Um, the town has been programmed $77.3 million, million in federal funds for road rehabilitation. These funds will be used after a lot of the projects that are going on right now, like the undergrounding and, and restoration of utilities and obviously tree removal. So these funds were made possible after a North Valley Community Foundation grant really helped us document campfire specific roadway damages using innovative laser technology. And I just wanna mention, of course, we're seeing increased usage um, and damage to our roads and, and certainly those are concerns we wanna make sure that we have the funding available to restore our road system um, after a lot of the debris removal we're going through right now and some of these infrastructure projects. So there are several tier one priority projects in the long-term community recovery plan that we've um, really kind of consolidated. Um, evacuation routes, missing road segments, dead end streets, and more. And I want to say that the town did receive a $1.8 million EDA grant um, to fund a, a transportation master plan. And so this master plan is gonna help us, as I said, consolidate a lot of those tier one projects and develop a plan for the town. So the, the transportation master plan will really help us understand how, it, how to improve circulation in town on a daily basis, and of course, if we're experiencing uh, an emergency. The transportation master plan is an analysis of the current Paradise uh, transportation network, and it will help us understand um, critical gaps in infrastructure, as I mentioned, circulation conflicts and pinch points throughout town, and any barriers to safe evacuation. The town will utilize this information to prioritize these road improvement projects over time and certainly as we complete the other projects I mentioned, we wanna get those priority projects in line for rehabilitation and construction in town. So you may see out and about in the field um, throughout town surveyors um, in the coming months and, and some of these surveyors may be associated with uh, the development of our transportation master plan. So now with that, I'd like to invite Mark Maddox to the stage. He is our public works director and town engineer, and he is going to provide an update on the Paradise Sewer Project. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, again, my name is Mark Maddox. I'm the public works director and town engineer for the town of Paradise, and I am so excited to be here tonight. I'm checking sound, getting closer. All right, here we go. Um, thank you for joining us in a deeper dive into the Paradise Sewer Project. And I'm really excited to provide a presentation for uh, this topic for you tonight. So to start, if you're new to Paradise, you may not have known we were the largest community west of the Mississippi that relied solely on septic systems, meaning each individual parcel in town has an on-site septic tank and leach line of some sort for wastewater treatment and disposal. So moving forward, if you have been here the entire time in Paradise, you know we've been talking about this issue for the greater part of five decades, dating back to 1969 in original Butte County's um, general plan element for wastewater disposal in Paradise. Can we actually go back one slide? I do wanna take this opportunity to identify a couple of key definitions as we move forward. Uh, we define the Paradise Sewer Project to be an overall effort to provide a long-term solution for the collection, treatment, and dispersal of wastewater from parcels identified in the sewer service area. That is key because we really need clear messaging and communication about the project and understanding we are proposing a, a solution to this um, area identified here in the areas on in yellow, primarily with parcels encompassed by Skyway, Clark, and Pearson with a few exceptions in between. All right, now I'm ready for the next slide, thank you. 
So why did paradise need a, a, a sewer before the fire? For many properties in paradise, perpetual on-site treatment and dispersal was not sustainable due to high groundwater, small parcel size, and uh, limited land available. These constraints forced the town to self-govern and restrict multifamily housing and density and commercial operations. And what that really means is for restaurants, we had to govern the number of seats that they could serve, as well as, uh, for example, uh, a hair salon, how many chairs or how many employees they could have at a given operation to reduce that water usage and make sure that we're not overwhelming the capacity of the land to treat the wastewater before it's dispersed to the groundwater. All right, and here's a pre-fire map that we developed back in the 2017 feasibility study that really was akin to understanding the projected failure rates of these parcels in town, especially on the primary corridor of Skyway, where we do have many small parcel sizes and very high groundwater. And so we were able to track and project um, existing failures the town was seeing, as well as understanding uh, existing septic systems that were about to fail and had no other option for replacement. All right, so fast forward to the uh, campfire reality and recovery that we're moving forward. Overnight, we experienced an 83% population loss. While the city of Chico um, took in much of that population, the region wide, um, we are still have a net loss of 16,000 residents. And city wastewater flows increased due to the campfire, yet revenues lagged through housing consolidation, whether that be accessory dwelling units or uh, families just living more densely in their existing homes. And we believe the presence or absence of a sewer project in Paradise really will shape the full recovery for Paradise. And that mostly ties into housing. As you know, we are in the midst of a regional housing crisis, especially acutely in, par in Paradise. And our ability to provide multifamily housing, affordable multifamily housing, hinges solely on our ability to provide a sewer as well as providing much needed community services like restaurants. So regional projects are preferred in California, and this is not new. Um, and so we've evaluated in a part of our uh, pre-environmental impact review report, which I'll be talking about here shortly. We've identified other comparable projects throughout the state that have done this and that have proven that it's a, it can and will be successful. Um, examples of this exist in Lincoln, Auburn and Placer County, Gilroy, Morgan Hill, Roseville, uh, South Placer County uh, Municipal Utility District, and Placer. In addition, uh, the state and uh, water board has uh, supportive policies which encourage regionalization, as well as the city of Chico and their municipal code does outline procedures for regionalization of their water pollution control plant. Slide. And so with, um, with our journey over the last 12 months, we took a fresh look of, at the project as a whole and evaluated five different alternatives, but mainly those can be boiled down to a local treatment plant can we build one and cite it locally, or do we look at a, a, a regional option in coordination with the city of Chico? Now, for a variety of reasons, including cost, environmental impacts, operations, permitting, and implementation, the regional option is the preferred option. In fact, it's the only feasible option left moving forward for the Paradise Sewer Project. Let me go to the slide. And so fast forward to the environmental impact report. We are just beginning these uh, next steps. And so we really do want to extend our invitation and appreciate any feedback that you can uh, provide and participate as a stakeholder in our recovery and participate in the environmental impact report phase. There is an extensive list of items that are gonna be completed over the next 18 months. This is not a fast track project and there is no circumvention of, of normal processes for CEQA review and uh, NEPA for a National Environmental Protection Act policy. And we're uh, just grateful and excited to move forward in this way. So with that, uh, we've been working with the city of Chico as well, and they have studies of their own to undertake. And the Town of Paradise has been granted a um, allocation of funding from the State Water Board Division of Financial Assistance, which will provide funding to the city of Chico to perform their, their own investigations to determine the feasibility of their water pollution control plant to accept our project moving forward. This includes the uh, modeling of future flows and loads, evaluating capacity, creating models, projecting infrastructure improvements that would be required. And again, the objective of that would be to inform the city council of City of Chico, and of course our town council, as well as the impacts 
of the uh, project collaboration concurrent to the environmental impact report. So one of the items in addition to the normal EIR process that we've added to help provide some comfort to our community and the cities as well is to the creation of the Sewer Regionalization Project Advisory Committee, SURPAC for short. This committee will help the inform, the, inform and facilitate the EIR process while um, providing updates on that City of Chico scope of work that we were just discussing um, and uh, provide opportunities for public input on a monthly basis in addition to our, again, our normal CEQA process. These meetings are scheduled to start monthly beginning next Monday, March 8th at 1 p.m. Th this will be a virtual meeting and it will consist of the cooperative work agreement signatories between the Town of Paradise and City of Chico and our elected vice mayor and mayors for both communities. And so we are so excited to begin that process and really hope that you'll join us in uh, providing comments and feedback. So next steps for the Paradise Sewer Project is when, uh, we get that question a lot, we are all ready in, uh, to move forward in recovery, especially when it comes to multifamily housing. Uh, with the environmental process, we're again projecting 18 months with potentially a draft EIR before the year's end and a fi final EIR by June of 2022. If we can continue to secure funding, we will immediately begin design and right-of-way funds. <laughs> Having some audio issues. Uh, design and right-of-way will begin in 2022 and last about two years. And construction, at earliest, we project in 2024. So again, it's a long road ahead, but we're so excited in the terms of Paradise's recovery. We know we are talking in generations and decades and years and things that are so valuable and important to be a part of, and we, we are just so grateful uh, for all of the different funding uh, entities that have joined us in this partnership and look forward to your input as well as we go forward. With that, I'd be glad to introduce Kate Anderson to discuss housing updates. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and good evening. Um, I'd like to uh, let you know what is available right now in your housing department for our citizens and what we are working on. So currently we do have a Rebuild Advocate program and this is where um, uh, our advocates can assist residents with any barriers that they are facing during their rebuild. These uh, advocates are available at our Building Resource Center and the uh, times and contact information is um, both available here and this presentation is available online at Naked Paradise and uh, available on YouTube. Uh, we also have our rehab and reconstruction program. We have quite a bit of funding for this program, about $25 million specifically for Paradise, specifically to help folks rebuild. And it is in a deferred loan, which means there are no monthly payments. It can be up to $150,000 to assist with the cost of the rebuild. And that is through our housing department at the Town of Paradise. You can request a program interest form. You just fill that out to get uh, things started there. And lastly, we have a first time home buyer program available where we can offer up to $40,000 in down payment assistance for low income households. Uh, campfire survivors are considered first time home buyers because they do not have a habitable structure currently. So um, it's a little bit of a misnomer with the first time home buyer. So we would encourage all residents interested in, in rebuilding or purchasing to come to the town of Paradise or give us a call, uh, send us an email and get more information because we're happy to assist. On to the next slide. And we do have quite a bit in the works uh, currently as well. Uh, in the next week or two, we'll be sending out a, a local census survey. As you might have heard, um, having a disaster just before a census year is not ideal. So a large amount of our population was not counted in the 2020 census. And we would like to understand more about the people who are living here now. And hopefully we will be able to do this uh, survey on an annual or biennial 
basis every two years so that we can continue to understand what our growth looks like. This information is really important for uh, um, the staff to apply for federal and state funding uh, in order to bring more resources to help us rebuild. So we hope that you will participate. It will be mailed out to all uh, CITUS addresses in Paradise through the Postal Service where there are deliveries, and it will be available online as well. So please do participate. We also have coming up our housing element and our consolidated plans uh, that are currently being developed. Our housing element is part of the general plan and our consolidated plan uh, is a five-year plan of how we're going to spend our CDBG annual allocation. And uh, these are great opportunities for the public to give your input on what you would like to see. So stay tuned, we'll let you know when those uh, public workshops are available to give your opinions. Next, we have a septic tank replacement program that's in the works with the State Water Resource Control Board. Uh, this is for rebuilds only, so we won't be replacing a septic tank on a vacant lot. But if you're looking to rebuild it and you need assistance, um, this is a grant. It's not income-based, so it is available to anyone who um, is rebuilding on the property that they lost their home on. And we're thinking that will be available in the next month or two. Uh, we also have a ign uh, residential ignition resistance program. This is where uh, the, we will be able to offer up to 75% in a grant where the homeowner contributes 25% toward updating standing structures to make them WUI compliant. So we're talking about siding and uh, class A roof, proper venting, decks, um, uh, doors and windows, things like that. And these are available for those structures that made it through the fire, but maybe they're not as fire resistant as they could be. So uh, we're in the works with this program and this should be available this summer. Uh, lastly, we're working with um, the state housing community development and through the, uh, for the federal funds of community development block grant. Uh, Mark had mentioned that um, infrastructure, the sewer system is vital to our housing up here in Paradise and vital to multifamily housing in particular. So the, much of the uh, CDBG disaster recovery grant is for housing. The state of California is performing their own uh, rehab reconstruction program and they'll be offering a grant of up to 200,000 and it is a grant for low income households who are looking to return and need uh, further assistance. And there's also an element for multifamily rentals, two types of projects. Uh, one is a large scale, large development project where it's eight units or more. And we'll also be rolling out a small project where it's between one and uh, seven rental units. So if uh, someone had a single family rental unit and that's all they want to put back, there could be uh, some grant opportunity to assist them to put back those rental units that we lost in the fire. And it could be a duplex uh, up to from one to seven units. So we have um, $55 million to use toward multifamily housing for our renters and uh, we'll be providing you with more information on these programs shortly. So with that, next up, I believe we have the team from Cal OES. Is that correct? Maybe. There we go. Thank you.
good evening. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Cole Gwenright. I'm with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. I'm joined this evening by Chris McSwain with the California Department of Resource Recycling and Recovery, better known as CalRecycle. Um, we're going to speak tonight about an update on the Campfire State Hazard Tree Removal Program. There's a lot going on with the program, so we're excited to be able to give you an update tonight. We're going to go through a little background on the project, uh, the stages it moves through. We're going to talk through some of the milestones and uh, successes we've seen on the project, and then we'll answer some frequently asked questions. Um, so to start, uh, like a number of the projects discussed tonight, the Hazard Tree Removal Program is principally federally funded, so we wanted to talk through first our federal eligibility and the funding side. Uh, this project is driven um, on an infrastructure protection basis, so trees are primarily eligible if they threaten roads, public roads, private roads, or other infrastructure. Um, you probably recall from earlier community meetings, we do include private roads in this program. That was a, a significant change uh, from federal policy that they were able to see, uh, see the light with us there and bring private roads in. So that's our general eligibility. That's what we're working toward. There's essentially at a high level two scopes to this project and we'll talk through in detail uh, what goes into both of those and where we are on both of those. But there's essentially an assessment phase scope and then a removal phase scope. It's important to realize that these are separate and they are done by separate contractors. Um, they're essentially going concurrently at this point, but they are discrete lines of effort. Go to the next slide here. Okay, so at a high level, this is the stage a parcel moves through in our process. Site-specific conditions can mean that different steps may happen on different properties depending on the sorts of trees or the conditions you have, but at a high level, we see properties go through these stages. Uh, the project starts with enrollment. Uh, folks submitted rights of entry through Butte County that were transmitted over the state of California. Um, we've received uh, the universe of those at this point. Enrollment is closed now. It closed at the beginning of the year. Um, they then go into an assessment and survey phase. We assess each tree individually. A certified arborist holding a tree risk assessment qualification makes that assessment. We also perform uh, surveys by biologists and archaeologists to make sure we're respecting the natural environment and complying with those federal environmental requirements. Um, properties then go into the felling and clearing stage where licensed timber operators or contractors uh, fell and remove the trees. Um, that happens over a couple stages. Generally, you may see different crews come onto your property over a short time frame there to fell the trees, manage the wood, um, chip some of the slash on site, things like that. Um, the wood is then transported off. Uh, they're primarily using debris trucks to remove the wood. So if you see the large trucks moving around town with the HTRP logo on the side, those are trucks that are removing the timber. Um, they're taking them to reuse. Uh, all of the material is going to local facilities, uh, primarily here in Butte County um, from the town of Paradise. So we're seeing that be reused locally. Um, and then each property goes through the final sign-off process, which is essentially our quality control at the end. A state representative, someone from my team, does walk each property. Um, they confirm the contractor completed their scope of work. If there's additional work that needs to be done, they make sure that's corrected before we sign the property off there. Right. Uh, we'll talk next about some of the program milestones. This project has, like a number of the projects discussed tonight, um, been going on for some time and has a little bit to go. Um, certainly, the hazard tree removal aspect of recovery was contemplated really, you know, from the start of the incident, from the day of the fire. Um, but as we got into around October 2019, we really started to see some progress there. That's when enrollment began, right around near the end of the structural debris program. ROE centers opened in uh, both the town and county areas. Uh, they later transitioned only to virtual enrollment due to COVID-19, as we're all familiar. Um, and that enrollment phase, as you can see, continued while the state and federal government worked together to establish that eligibility, make some of those critical decisions we talked about, like the inclusion of private roads, um, and while we worked to procure those contractors. Um, in August 2020, uh, we saw assessments begin. So that was a big milestone. That was the first field work we had on the project. Um, at peak, we had uh, 40 to 50 arborists working on the project. Um, and so that, that line of effort continues. We'll show where we are on that in a second. Um, but in November of 2020, uh, we had another significant milestone. That's when tree felling actually began. That work began um, both in the town and county at exactly the same time. Um, and those are separate contractors, one working in the town and one working in the county that are processing and removing those trees. Um, in December 2020, uh, at the end of the year there is when enrollment ended. Um, of note, this is the longest running uh, ROE process in the state's debris removal program's history. Uh, in total, we had over 8,500 property owners sign up, which um, we're really proud of the work our local partners were able to do to keep folks engaged even as we went through this pandemic to get folks signed up. So we're happy to see a, a, a significant number took advantage of the program. Um, and we are now fully into operations as of uh, February of this year. We're at past the 30% tree removal mark. We'll show you where we are currently, um, but we're tracking those milestones there as we go. Uh, slide here. So 
projections a little difficult to see, but this is uh, where we are presently. So you can see the first graph where we're at 98% complete. Um, that's the assessment that we talked about with the arborists assessing the trees. So we are substantially complete with that line of effort. Some of that work will continue as we um, move additional parcels uh, from phase to phase, things of that nature. Um, but we're substantially into the tree removal line of effort. You can see presently we're at 35% complete. So we're seeing that click through there. We're seeing efficiencies increase as we increase crews and things of that nature. Um, total, we've got 13,534 trees removed out of the 38,625 trees identified. Um, now, this, these statistics are specific to the town of Paradise. Um, obviously, the universe, including the unincorporated county areas like Concow, Megalia, communities in Lower Butte, uh, is larger. Our general uh, percent complete statistics are right around the same mark, though, in terms of percentages. Um, so I'll turn it next to Chris, who's going to speak through some frequently asked questions about the project. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to address you and um, share some of the, st the, the questions that we get a lot and, and help bring you um, kind of up to date on some of the things that people are wondering, things that people are wondering about. So uh, the first slide, one of the questions we get frequently is about who is going to be coming to your property. Calor Cycle uh, has been doing this program, not specifically trees, but wildfire recovery for over 14 years. Our expertise is managing contractors, making sure that they are compliant with all laws and regulations and that they follow the rules according to what your local expectations are as well as state and federal rules. And so there's a lot of people involved. Now you're not gonna see 20 people on your property while the trees are coming down. Uh, as Cole suggested, it's multiple phases, but you'll have arborists, foresters, plus people OSHA, which we don't even have on the list, but OSHA may come by to make sure that work, worker safety is followed. Um, and so the, all of them are about making sure that these trees are taken down properly. One of the things I want to hit on, and, and just because it's so important what Cole said, is our arborists and our tree cutters are, work for separate companies. <laughs> they don't work together, and the company that employs the arborists will be on hand when the trees are cut to make sure that everything is done according to that arborist assessment and to make sure that check and balance is there. Plus we have state staff to go ahead and follow through on that process. So it's very important to make sure that uh, there are enough eyes um, on the program to make sure things are done properly. Next slide. Will I be notified about tree felling on my property. Yes, you will. Uh, initially, we had talked about a 24 to 48 hour notice. We have expanded that. One of the things we found is that if we give uh, property owners a little bit more time to respond and we get a hold of you, it actually picks up the efficiency of the program and makes the program run better. So this is going to be better for property owners. You'll get a little bit more notice when we're going to be there, but also gives our contractors the time to make sure that they're deploying to that site efficiently and can move through the process as quickly as possible, which we know everybody uh, cares about. Next slide. We've gotten questions about whether marked trees that have fallen before our timber operators have gone there, whether those will be removed. Originally, we have had to tell people no, but we have heard from your local officials, we have heard from property owners, and we have looked back uh, to the contract and talked to our contractors, and we will now be removing those trees. Now, we may be coming back for some of them because we have moved on, but uh, if a tree that has been marked by an arborist as being a danger to the right of way, if all or a portion of it has fallen before it was cut down, we will, we will take care of that. I want to also mention that um, whether it's somebody being on your property, by the way, you should see that HTRP sign in, in their vehicle. Um, if you have questions, we fully support your reaching out. Now, the best way to do this is through the Paradise Tree Advocates, but be your own advocate. And, and if you have a question about that, if you feel like a tree um, has fallen and we missed it, please reach out. That's the way this program works. Uh, we are responsive to uh, the town and to the community, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're able to respond to any of those requests. So feel free to, to let us know if you have concerns about anything. 
So you can reach out to the Paradise Tree Advocates, but you can also find more information on ButteCountyRecovers.org. One of those things you'll see there is there is an interactive map that lets you put in your address, and you can find out what the status is on your property, as well as your neighbors. Let's be honest, we, 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 we kind of like to see what's happening community-wide. So that's a good tool to use. Um, and I think, did, did I get it all there, Cole? Okay. Um, I think we're handing it off now to Dan Dana Gaida with the Hope Plaza Project. Dana got a Hope Plaza committee. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So Hope Plaza is a space where the community and visitors can gather to honor those that lost their lives in the campfire. Hope Plaza is an emblem of hope, renewal, and resiliency. Over time, we've changed the design of Hope Plaza after some public input on certain aspects of it. So I wanted to show you a video of what the plaza looks like now. So we're going to show that if we may. Ready for that? We'll see. Um, so you saw one of the changes we made, um, we added a hope tree um, that took the place of what, where we had an obelisk. Um, but that hope tree is a really cool thing. Um, it's going to be the centerpiece of the Hero Plaza, part of the, part of the project. Um, and also you saw in there that there was a large granite sphere that, that floats on water. Currently, um, we are going to take public input on the inspirational words that'll go on that sphere. So if you go to our website, um, you'll have an opportunity to, to do that. And it's listed there, hopeplazaparadise.com. And also I wanted to mention that the entire project will be funded through private donations from individuals, businesses, organizations, and also with in-kind donations from contractors um, in the form of labor and materials. So no taxpayer dollars. And in the next month or two, um, we're gonna start on the grading, hopefully, so you should see some movement there. And like I said, if you want some more information, you can go to hopeplazaparadise.com and take a deeper look at the project. Um, you can make a donation if you'd like, and, and then you can just learn more about it. So we encourage you to go to the website. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Rebuild Paradise Foundation for helping making this happen, and also Melton Design Group. So like I said, go to the website, get some more information, and you can learn more about Hope Plaza. Thank you. OK, so we, we have a couple of questions that we'll ask, and we'll ask the individuals to come up. Um, the first one, Katie, is for you. Is there any plan to address the dead trees that are not hazard to public roads? I can't re rebuild until my neighbor removes their trees leaning on our property and they are nowhere to be found. 
Sure, so as I mentioned, we're working through the um, private tree removal program, and that is where property owners have opted to remove their trees on their own. And as I said, 97% of those properties are complete. And then as Cole was mentioning, um, the state is moving through and removing the trees that are in the enrolled properties for the government hazard tree removal program. So what I wanna say is at this point, we're um, facing quite a few unenrolled properties or properties that enrolled in the private program that are incomplete. And so the town is taking steps towards abating those properties, uh, which will be costly and um, burdensome and time consuming, of course, for the town and for the property owner. So what we want to mention is if you're concerned about your neighbor's property um, or trees that are threatening your structure or you're not sure if your neighbor's enrolled or what your status is of your property, um, Chris was mentioning the public facing map on ButteCountyRecovers.org, but I want to offer the ability to contact our tree advocates at the town, contact them directly if you're unenrolled, if your neighbor's unenrolled, if you have questions about the status, because there are lots of questions about trees. Um, they can give the town a call, 530-872-6291, extension 162, and extension 163. In addition, so we're talking specifically now about trees that are eligible under the hazardous tree removal ordinance, but I also want to mention that the town has applied for additional funding for category four tree removal. So these are for trees that are in the back parts of the properties, trees that are not eligible for removal in the government program, not required in the private program. These are um, trees on, on large properties that are set back far from roads, but maybe hanging over a structure. So that, as I said, um, we're still waiting to hear if the town is going to receive um, these funds. We've asked for 20 million, and these funds would become available for property owners to essentially apply for them almost as a grant, um, and then they would be able to um, make a contribution themselves, or the town is also looking for um, the matching grant portion of the hazard mitigation grant coming in. So lots happening on trees. I just said a lot. I might have confused you even more. So if you have questions, call the tree advocates at the town, 530-872-6291, extensions 162 or 163, or you can reach us at trees at townofparadise.com. Thanks, sorry, with only one working mic here. Um, next question is for Mark. Um, how do I find out if my property is included in the sewer project? Thank you, Val. Great question. Um, I didn't get a chance to mention. Uh, we have a website also at paradisesewer.com. And at this location, you can find a tab at the top that says map. And with that map, you can enter in your property address and it will tell you a direct result if you are in or out of the proposed sewer service area. And that's it, thank you. And Kate, a question for you. Someone said, I didn't lose my house, but I lost all of my belongings. I bought land and I would like to build. Can they still get a housing grant? So this uh, individual did not lose their home in the campfire, yet they're looking to um, they bought land and they're looking to rebuild. So they wouldn't fall under a first time home buyer program because they're already on title to property and they wouldn't uh, qualify for uh, program funds to rebuild their home. But there are other funds that may be available like USDA, um, I'm not sure if SBA, but we can provide those um, uh, context to anyone who's interested F so for any housing questions please feel free to give us a call at the town uh, we are at 530-872-6291 housing is extension 122 and we also have a housing uh, email address housing at townofparadise.com and we are happy to help in any way that we can to assist with any questions regarding housing thank you Thank you. And one last question. I'm not sure if for Katie or perhaps for Kevin, but someone, it's about RVs. They're wanting to know how long um, they can still live in one on their property while they're rebuilding. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, so that if you're in the process of rebuilding and moving forward, our RV ordinance right now is uh, extended all the way through December of this year. Um, if you're not in the process of rebuilding and you're not enrolled in any program, right now it's looking to expire as of June 30th this year, of this year. Uh, just to let you know though, we are looking at, um, the council will be looking at this ordinance probably for the next couple council meetings to see uh, where we move that forward. But um, at this point in time, June 30th, if, if you're not in the process or not enrolled into a program or don't have a permit pulled, December 31st, if you have any of those. Great, thank you. Okay, so that's all we have for questions. So thank you again, everyone, um, for tuning in. This recording will be available both on YouTube and on Facebook for playback after um, the live event is ended, so feel free to go through and review. If you did send in a question that was very specific to a site, we will be forwarding those questions to the appropriate department and they will respond directly. Thanks for coming.